So this morning, we will try to uh, present the existence of two diametrically opposed kingdoms. And this, uh, these two kingdoms uh, go way, way back in the history that we read about in the scriptures that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And it's clearly seen in the life of Christ. And it's seen in your life and my life as well. So I want to show you uh, just how real and how often widespread this clash of kingdoms is. We live in a world where these kingdoms collide, these kingdoms uh, are opposed to one another. And I would like to, at the end of the service today, to invite you to become, uh, or to be committed again to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You may think, well, I'm committed, I'm here, and we'll talk about that. <laughs> So at the end, I'm going to give you a chance to respond uh, in the way of commitment. So the first thing I want to talk about is what is a kingdom? You know, we talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. What is a kingdom? We don't really understand it in the way that some cultures do because they have kings and one of uh, our dear friends from Jordan was so excited back in 1990 to go back home and see the king, King Hussein. She said, I've been in the United States for eight years and I want to see King Hussein. <laughs> and uh, so Julia Shahada was anxious to go back home. But what is a kingdom or what is a king? Well, first of all, it is someone who has the right to rule, someone who has been ordained, someone who has been authorized, someone who has been anointed, someone who has been installed or commissioned into the office. They have, they have the right to rule. Some authority has been vested in them. Um, uh, sovereignty has been granted to them. Uh, dominion has been granted to them. Um, and it's, we can kind of get sidetracked here, but um, there's a, Luke chapter 19, verses 19 through tw or 11 through 27, if you want to read that later on today. It's speaking of this idea of seeking a kingdom, uh, seeking the uh, authority to, to rule. And... Uh, so uh, a king or a kingdom, there has to be the right to rule, the authority to rule. Secondly, there has to be a realm over which to rule. So if I'm a king, I have to have subjects, right? If you're going to have a kingdom, you have the authority to rule, but you also need to have subjects. You have to have people over whom your rule extends. And then thirdly, and I think this is where we get into trouble as Christians, not, I'm saying some, and I think in our culture today, many Christians are struggling with this because then there is the reality of the rule. The rule that actually uh, is, it works, it actually happens. It's the exercise of royal authority. Even if a sovereign has the right to rule and a realm in which to rule, there cannot be an actual kingdom apart from the active exercise of that authority. Um, <clears throat> we have, for example, uh, I had a conversation with the chief of police in Winlock this week, not because he pulled me over. Uh, <laughs> They park right up the road from us, and I was mowing the lawn, and I stopped to talk to him. And then uh, after we talked for a while, I told, I said, that's my wife down there. He said, oh, do you live there? And I said, yeah. And I said, I need to go back and let my wife know where I've been. She didn't know I was up here mowing. And he said, that's okay. Just tell her I pulled you over on your lawnmower. <laughs> 
Now, actually, if you have a, a police officer, you have the Winlock Police Department, right? And, hit, and so they have the authority, they have the badge, they have been authorized to enforce the laws and to, uh, to serve in a local jurisdiction. And then they have uh, the city, the people who live here, the subjects underneath of them. And that's the people driving their car way too fast in front of my house, you know, or some other thing. I'm just teasing. Um, so, but they have to have the uh, subjects, and then they need to have enforcement of laws, obedience to laws. Doesn't do any good to have authority, have a realm, and then not have obedience, not having um, the authority of the city uh, enforced. So, uh, when we get to John chapter 18, we are going to find this collision of two kingdoms. Uh, we're going to see two figures on, on the order of service today. There's a picture, you can't see it, but it's a picture of Pilate and, the, and Christ Jesus. And... Uh, the location is the Praetorium. The Praetorium was the place where the Roman official lived or where he conducted his business. And so you have the governor of Judea, authorized to govern Judea, Judea by, by Rome, and then you have Jesus Christ, authored to govern the world by uh, his father, and so Pilate and Jesus standing there. That picture is pretty amazing. The word praetorium is a Latin word. It means, uh, usually it, it was a tent where the general would hang out. Um, and the praetor was the Roman magistrate. And it, the praetorium was his headquarters or residence where a Roman official, governor, or military commander stayed. So they would stay in the Praetorium. And um, so we have Jesus standing here before Pilate. And I think that that picture is the representation of two kingdoms. It is the representation of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. Uh, one author talked about the city of man and the city of God. Um, we have one is described as earthly and political and national and um, like Rome. And the other is considered heavenly and spiritual and uh, not defined by politics, not defined by Borders, not defined by anything. It's the universal reign or kingdom of God himself. And so Jesus is the king. He has the right to rule. He was, uh, 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 as king, he was on trial before Pilate. That is what's so amazing. You have Pilate who had the authority to judge the authority to decide whether Jesus would live or die. The Jews didn't have that authority, but uh, Rome certainly did. And so here you have King Jesus standing before Pontius Pilate, the judge, but it's really King, it is really Pon Pontius Pilate that's on trial here. It's an amazing, amazing situation. And if you, uh, you know, we, we just don't have time. This is not a uh, Bible study where we can go verse by verse by verse by verse for the next months because these uh, trials of Jesus took place and Mark and Matthew and Luke and John all talk about this week in the life of Christ. And they, they will describe three 
religious trials that Jesus went through, illegal religious trials before Annas, before Caiaphas, and uh, um, anyway, there's three of them. And then there's three civil trials where Jesus stands before Pilate. He's sent up to stand before Herod. Then he's brought back to Pilate. There's a second uh, trial. And eventually Jesus is, um, you know, Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. And I, I can't believe how many times Pilate looked at Jesus and tried to tell people there's, he hasn't done anything wrong. There's nothing that he has done that's been worthy of death. And so over and over and over again, Pilate um, says uh, that, that um, he's not guilty and he washes his hands. Um, and I could go through all of those during the first trial, during the second trial, after uh, the crowd renders its decision that we would rather have Barabbas than Jesus, Pilate says it again. And then he washes his hands. And after he's scourged, after he's whipped and beaten, um, Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. But when we get to chapter 18, verse 33, you have this amazing interchange between Jesus and Pilate. And it really has to do with, does he have the right to rule? Does he have authority? Does he have a kingdom? Are you a king? We're hearing that you're a king. Do you have that authority, Jesus? And so look at 18, verse uh, 30, 33. Be, Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium. That's the Roman Gentile off-limits place that Jews could not enter. If they went into there, they would be considered defiled. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you a king? Do you have authority? Do you have a realm? Are you ruling? That's what he was interested in. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? And Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. And what have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom, my kingdom kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom, we don't have soldiers. We are not going to fight politically. We are not going to uh, overthrow the Romans. I am not that kind of a king. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that, <clears throat> um, sorry, I lost my place, so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. You know, we are called upon to know what's going on in the political scene, to know world politics. We need to fight for our country. We need to be good citizens of the United States, but our kingdom is not of this world. And there are believers in Christ who are part of the kingdom of God who live in Russia, and they live in China, and they live in the Ukraine, and they live in the Philippines, and they live all around the world, part of the universal church, part of the kingdom of Christ wherever we live. And I think it's been a big thing from the beginning when Christians will not bow their knee to Caesar, when they will not bow their knee to 
Putin when they will not bow their knee to Mao Zedong, when they will not bow their knee to Pol Pot, when they will not bow their knee to the rulers of this world and the kingdoms of this world. I think that there's just something inside of certain leaders that can't stand the fact that they cannot control the people of God ultimately. And they can't. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, So, anyway. um, But if you'll turn with me back to Genesis chapter 3, I'm just going to briefly have us look at where this clash of kingdoms began. This is the usurping, this is the attack, full-scale attack against the kingdom of God, (laughs) against the will of God. This was the uh, subtle but devastating blow that was um, uh, wielded against humankind. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed has God said that you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. There is the questioning of the authority of God the Creator right there. It It is the entrance of a question It is the entrance of the questioning of God's right, his sovereign rule over his creation. So the question is, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. She was right. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. She knew what God had said, right? The serpent said to the woman, and now it's not a question. Now it's just blatant, you will not die. So you have Satan saying one thing and, and um, standing against God who has said another thing. That is the clash of kingdoms. And that had devastating impact on the human race. Um, for, and then you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that humankind fell, there's the fall of man. There is the crumbling. There is the devastating consequence of separation of human beings from God spiritually. And the beginning of the clock of death in the life of Adam and Eve. And the results of this clash of kingdoms is it goes all through the Bible. And if you read the Old Testament and you see the sin and sometimes disgusting sin and sometimes you can't even read it kind of sin in the Old Testament, it starts with this clash of kingdoms in, um, in the Old Testament. So Let's go back to John, because here you have Jesus, King Jesus, standing before Pilate, uh, the governor of Judea. He was the one who ruled um, in that day. Um, And I want you to just quickly just hold your place in John 19, but just look over at Colossians chapter 1. Paul makes this so abundantly clear. This is, if you're a believer in Christ, this is true. This is true of you. This is true of me. This is a a fact for every person who has placed their trust 
and their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. This is true of you. This is wonderful. It says, verse 13 of Colossians 1, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So if you're a believer in Christ, you have been rescued out of the domain of Satan. You have been, you needed, every person needs to be rescued out of the domain of Satan and transferred under again the rule under the authority into the realm of Jesus, King Jesus. And he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And we could go on there. So we have been transferred out of that if we're a believer in Christ. The idea that I think of when I think about that process of I'm part of Satan's kingdom. I am separated from God. That's why the church needs to share the gospel boldly because people don't even understand that. They just think we're all in the same boat and we all, you know, we just need to start going to church and we just need to start being better people and give more to charity and send money to the Ukraine and, you know, all this stuff and that will get us into the kingdom. But that's not how it works. We have to be transferred into the kingdom through the blood of Christ, through faith in Christ and Him alone. And all that is, it is the establishment of a beachhead. My, I got to go up this week, uh, a couple days ago, to Harborview Hospital and see my, uh, my mom's uh, best brother. She loves them all, but she and Bud were really, really close. And so I have a recording on my phone now of him telling a little bit of his story because he was in World War II. Toward the end of World War II, he uh, signed up for the Navy and uh, he went to gunnery school over in uh, Farragut, Idaho, Sandpoint. Learned how to, you know, figure out coordinates. So I, I asked him what that all meant. And he says, well, basically, it's like, I tell the guy with the gun where to shoot. And then he shoots there. That, that was my job, is to figure out the coordinates and say, shoot there. And they would shoot there. And he told me about the guns that he shot and everything. But I have such deep respect for him. He, he, was, in, uh, he was on a troop transport ship. Um, that would, I think he said there were 28 landing craft on the ship, and then they would come ashore in Iwo Jima mm -hmm. and also in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, you know the stories from the movies. The, the gate thing opens up and the landing craft head toward shore, and they're trying to establish a beach a beach, uh, what do you call it, what did I call it? A beachhead. A beachhead, yeah, thank you. And that's what they would do. They would get, just like Normandy, you know, we're going to go ashore, we're going to establish a position in Europe or in the Pacific, and from there, the rest of the war and all of the supplies and all of the support will come to you. And uh, so, um, when we trust Christ, we are, you are, transferred onto a, a beach. And sometimes you think, well, I'm here. That's all that God has for me in my life. I'm a Christian. It's all I have to worry about. I've trusted Christ. But I'm going to tell you, as followers of Christ, there's more of the island and more of Europe to conquer. Mm -hmm. And we have just begun as believers, just to trust in Christ is just the beach head. That's all it is. There is so much more ahead for the believer. Until we get to heaven, we, have, uh, we need to uh, allow God to help us 
conquer the sin in our life and to take more and more territory in our life. And so, um, got a couple of things I want to share with you. I'm going to sit down here. Um, I, this is a place where I think believers have to come in our lives. This is a place where um, it's a place of commitment. It is a place of consecration. It is a place once I've once I have arrived at the beach, um, there's a sense of my will, my surrender to the will of God to take not just the beach, but to take the whole island, to take the continent, to overcome the enemy in my life. And so if I was fully committed to Christ, I could say something like this. I recognize that the Lord has purchased me with his blood. I know that. And desires for me to trust him enough to present myself as a living sacrifice. I have surrendered. That would be a surrendered heart. That is someone who is on the beach God has brought, he has transferred me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. I'm on the beach, I'm on the beachhead, but now I'm saying something like this. I recognize that the Lord has purchased me with his blood. I'm here on the beach because of the blood of Christ. He owns me. I don't own myself. He owns me. He has the right. He's the king. He is the sovereign. He is the Lord in my life. And so that person says, and he desires for me to trust him enough to present myself as a living sacrifice. Now, if you're not willing, if you don't want that, you just want to sit on the beach and sit out the war, I hope not, we might say something like, I want to live my life the way I want I don't trust Christ enough to surrender my life and my future to him. That's someone who is not committed. The will has never been surrendered to him. Now in the middle, someone might say, I'm almost ready. I'm getting closer, but myself is still too strong. I am determined to get to the place where I will present myself as a living sacrifice in the near future, but I need to pass more tests. But then there's the person who's ready, and it says, I have finally come to the place that I realize that God loves me more than I love myself, and I can fully trust him. I am ready to present myself as a living sacrifice. And that, that's kind of the stages that we go through in this process of surrender to the Lord. But I'm going to tell you a very sad reality in the church. And I'm not looking out here at anybody here, but um, I've been going through a study with Shane. I went through this with uh, Darlene's grandson, it's a discipleship manual, talks about the four priorities. But there is a, a kind of a sad story, and I hope you don't fit in this story as a Christian. But let me kind of explain that there can be Christians who present themselves as Christians to the, to the world. They have bumper stickers on their car. They might carry a Bible to work. They might have plaques at home. They might wear a cross around their neck. They say, I'm on the beach. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus, and I'm on the beach. And I just want everybody to know that's what I present to the world. 
But then there's the reality of the life and the lifestyle and the choices that people make. And um, so I'm going to read this story. It's a case study. Shane and I went through that this week. Um, it's profound. So you'll just bear with me. I think you won't have any trouble listening to a little case study here. So Sherm Douglas was raised in Oklahoma and educated in Texas, his upbringing very much a product of the Bible Belt. His dad owned a very successful hardware store in a suburb of Tulsa. His mom devoted herself to volunteer work with several praiseworthy groups in town. This faithful family never missed a church meeting. A large family Bible graced the living room coffee table with Sherm's mother, which she dusted every week without fail. Sorry if I'm smiling. <laughs> I mean, it's not funny, but it makes me... Anyway, so Sherm always believed in God. After all, doesn't everybody? He would ask when questioned about his beliefs. He knew by heart old-time hymns like Amazing Grace and How Great Thou Art. Often the family would gather around the piano in the den on Sunday afternoon to sing church songs in four-part harmony. When the pastor and his wife were guests for Sunday dinner, a common occurrence, the evening wasn't complete without a good old-fashioned hymn sing. The Douglas family was also big on singing the doxology before every dinner. A plaque on the Lord, of the Lord's Prayer hung in the entryway of their large colonial-style home. I can identify with a lot of that. I can. I mean, just those are memories from my childhood upbringing. But here's the sad part. Although church attendance was a guarded core value, the choices, choices represent the will. Choices represent obedience. The choices of the Douglas family members were not necessarily consistent with sermons they heard from week to week. For example, at tax time, Sherm's dad failed to report the income he received in cash payments. The family liquor cabinet was stocked with whiskey, vodka, brandy, and wine, which Mr. Douglas drank to excess and suffered a hangover most Saturday mornings. When Sherm's sister got pregnant in junior high school, her daddy drove her to the clinic and paid for the abortion. And Sherm's two brothers chose not to marry their girlfriends, opting to live with them after graduating from college. Sherm graduated with honors from Baylor University and then proceeded to get his MBA at the University of Texas. It was during graduate school that he exchanged his nominal churchianity for a deeply personal Christianity. A campus minister leader convinced Sherm to join a weekly Bible study and with sharp, intelligent grad students who love the Lord in this small group of other CEOs in training, Sherm realized that he treated Jesus like a mascot or a lucky charm, not a master with whom he could have a relationship. So he decided to discard the superficial religion his parents and siblings had followed, and he embraced the Word of God as his guide for life. As a result, everything changed. When he accepted the scriptures as absolute truth inspired by his Creator, 
he began to cultivate new attitudes about compassion, interpersonal conflict, the use of alcohol, and stewardship of the environment. He also gained a completely new perspective on the commitment his wedding vows entail. No longer did Sherm march to the cadence of what culture deemed appropriate. Instead, he based his conduct on the answers to two questions. What does the Bible say about this issue and what would Jesus do? After earning the MBA, Sherm returned to Oklahoma where he went to work for an oil company. He married the attractive daughter of the company's president, and within 10 years, he was vice president. 10 years later, he replaced his father-in-law as top man with a salary that he was embarrassed to mention at MBA class reunions. <laughs> He wasn't embarrassed, however, to talk about Jesus. Sherm was an outspoken Christian who kept a dog-eared copy of his Bible on his desk. It wasn't for the sake of maintaining a good Christian image like his parents. He kept it handy because he referred to the Word of God often. He consulted scripture and every decision and with every decision and referred to it often in weekly staff meetings. At the age of 62, Sherm was blindsided with devastating diagnosis. Doctors told him that he had an inoperable brain tumor that would take his life in nine months. When Sherm shared this news with his small group at church, they rallied around him and prayed, asking for God's healing. One of Sherm's best friends in the group attempted to comfort him with verses concerning the brevity of life and the confidence we have as Christians that death is not to be feared but welcomed. Sherm could give mental assent to the fact that Christians should not fear death but accept the end of physical life as a transition to the presence of Christ. Even so, it was difficult to embrace the reality in his heart. He and his wife began to fly to Mexico and Europe, seeking alternative treatments, and Sherm died 11 months after his initial diagnosis. He did everything he could to find a cure, but in the end, cancer ended his life. Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> this is what the Lord laid on my heart this week. Matthew 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom, the, the realm, will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You understand that? We've been talking about kingdoms. There is the, the right and the authority to rule, and then there's the, the uh, realm, and then there's the actual kingdom. When we obey Christ, when he has our ear and he has our will and he has our attention and we are listening to him, God is not concerned with how many people sit in the chairs in any church. He is concerned about whether God's people, whether he has their attention whether their lives are changing, whether they are growing, whether they are maturing, whether they are becoming like Christ. And, and rather than presenting a public image, he's interested in the private reality of our hearts. 
and whether we are listening to him and whether we are being disciples, whether we are following him, whether we are getting his truth into our lives. And that's why when uh, Paul wrote to the Colossians, again, first uh, Colossians 1, 28, Paul said, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that what? What's the purpose? What was Paul's purpose in proclaiming the message of the kingdom, the message of Christ, the words of Christ? What was his, what was the purpose of all of that? No, it says right there, Brian. It says, so that we may present every man complete in Christ, mature in Christ. That doesn't really have all to do with knowledge. It has to do with obedience. It has to do with obeying something. Not knowing everything, but obeying things and following Christ out of an obedient heart. So, we pro- so that we may present every man complete, mature uh, in Christ. Um, <clears throat> so, <sighs> James chapter 1, I think that if James were here, he would probably explain this uh, text to us. But I think he would say, does the word, do we understand the word of God? Do we understand all the nuances and details of the word of God? How much do we know? How How much do we know? but I don't think that's what he would say. It really has to do with, does the word of God work? That's the word energize. Does it it change anything? And that's really the bottom line that I'm thinking of today is that we have a clash of kingdoms. We have uh, the enemy and we have Christ. And if he's the king, he has the authority to rule He has the the realm over which to rule, but the reality of his reign depends upon whether we are submitted to his will in everything. That has to do with, when I leave this building, am I going to go out and shack up with someone and not be married with them and have sexual intimacy with them because that's what I want to do? Or will I surrender my life to the will of God for my life, no matter what? Will I stay married? And will I uh, work on my marriage because I have made a commitment before God and I am, I am surrendering that part of my life to the Lord? Will He have control over my taxes? You guys have about... What, 12 more days to practice what you believe, practice what you preach. Um, Will I abstain from homosexual activity? Even if I have that inclination, even if I have that whatever desire, is Christ the Lord of my sexual life? Is he the Lord of my tongue? Is he the Lord over my propensity to gossip? Is he the Lord over um, how I drive my car? Is he the Lord over how I treat my spouse? Is he the Lord over how I treat my parents? Is he, the, is he, is he really the one who changes the way I live every day? That's a huge question. 
And I, I know that I've said this in the last few weeks because we've been on that topic, but if you look at 2 uh, Corinthians 5, I don't know if it's 2nd or 1st Corinthians, sorry. I'll look just a minute. My memory is not perfect. 2nd Corinthians. I think I'm just trying to say that there is more of the island to conquer than just getting on the beach. There is more of Europe. There is all the way to Berlin. There is the defeat of the Axis powers. There is control of France again and Holland and um, Germany and Scandinavia. It's defeating the enemy in my life. And then it says in 2 Corinthians 5, um, verse 9, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds, for his deeds, for his actions, for his words, for his decisions, for the decisions of his will, um, recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We can play the game. We can play the game of I'm a Christian and wear the bumper sticker and present to the world this Christian view, but God is going to evaluate for the purpose of reward. Can you say that with me again? For the purpose of reward. Not judgment for sin, but for the purpose of reward. He will pay back. He will reward. He will say, well done. He will have his way to go stickers. I don't know how it's going to happen, but he is going to reward his own for their obedience, for their ears which have listened to the word of God, whether good or bad. But we all are going to appear there one day at the Bema, at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, one last, James chapter 1, and then I'll close this and we'll go to communion. James chapter 1, verse 21, this is for you and me. We need this, we need to be reminded of this truth every single day. Because we live in a filthy world. We live in a terribly filthy, <coughs> sinful world. And so we have to be reminded. Here's what James says. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, put it aside. Get rid of it. In humility, receive the word implanted. Receive the word. Welcome the word of God implanted in my life, which is able to save your souls, which is not, I don't think it's speaking of ultimate salvation, but it will bring deliverance of your life here on earth and prove yourselves to be what? Doers of the word. Prove yourselves. Show the world that you are a doer of the Word of God. Do the Word of God. Obey the Word of God. Listen to Jesus. Doers of the Word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. They fake themselves out. They trick themselves. They delude themselves. I'm a Christian, 
but I'm living the way I want to live. That does not work. It says, get rid of sin and pay attention to the word of God. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man, this man will be blessed in what he does. And that is powerful. So, I am going to, we're going to have a time of communion, but I want to offer an opportunity for you. And uh, I think that the Bible always says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. And so humility is kind of like hard to do in front of other people. To humble yourself is, is tough. But what I would like to challenge you to do this morning before we take communion is uh, what we find on what I read earlier. If this is you, I have finally come to the place that I realize that God loves me more than I love myself. And I can fully trust him I am ready to present myself to him as a living sacrifice. And what I would like to ask you to do is to stand up where you are in just a minute. If that's who you are, this, is, this, is, this would be the message in your heart today. I recognize that the Lord has purchased me with his blood and desires for me to trust him enough to present myself as a living sacrifice. I have surrendered. There's a lot more that comes. We've been learning that it's just the tipping point. It's like when I can say to God, I am presenting my life to you, the rest of my life. I am Here I am. I present myself to you. There's a lot more that comes after that. What it means to, um, for God to have control of my life. There is. What it means to, to forsake all, to be his bondservant, to be his slave, to be his servant. I mean, there's lots of things, and it will take, I think it takes a long time to learn that, but it starts with a surrender of my life to Christ. So. Um, I don't have music playing. This is not meant to be an emotional stirring. But if you're here this morning and you need to make that commitment before God in humility and say, today I surrender my life to you. I present my life to you again. I present myself to you as a living sacrifice. Um, you can do it without standing up, but I'm going to ask you to stand up right now, just where you are. Amen. This isn't pass or fail. This is like between you and God.
Ja, ja. Father, I just pray for your blessing that comes upon those who are surrendered to you. There's blessing. There is fruitfulness and joy. I know that, Lord. I pray for all of us in this room, Lord, that we would every day say, not my will, but thine be done. Your will be done, Father, in my life. Your truth be lived out in my life, no matter what the cost. Your way in my life. You are the way and the truth and the life. God, I just pray that we would see the beachhead in our rearview mirrors and we would see the conquering of the evil one. Mm -hmm. One by one, little by little, Lord, that we would see the island taken back. We would see Europe um, liberated in our lives. God, we love you. And we just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, why don't we all stand? Well, no, you, don't, you can sit down for a second. Go ahead. I, I'm, this is not very well planned on my part, so we're going to take communion. And coming to the communion table is uh, a time of remembering Jesus. Remembering who he is. He's the king. He's the sovereign. He has the authority to rule over our lives. He has a realm. And he desires that we would be obedient subjects to him. Otherwise, we're, we're not in, we're not really, uh, it's not really the kingdom of God. It's my kingdom. So as you come today, uh, today we have the uh, safer cups that we've been using and we have uh, the old ones, the bread, and the little cups, and so you can take whichever you feel comfortable with, and um, we're just going to come to the communion table. Would someone like to pray? I've been doing a lot of the talking today, but would someone just lead us in prayer as we come to the communion table? Who will do that? Okay, Brian. Lord, we give thanks this day for your presence in the word that we have this to rejoice that you are the living God in the kingdom that we can be reinstated that you have given us and show others and that you have given us the wine and the bread to reinstate ourselves forever and ever again with the life that your word Jesus, the Son of God Well, let's just play our song. You can sing along if you like, but we'll play the gospel song. But if you just come uh, as the song is being played and come up and partake, you can sit, you can stand, you can go back to your seat. But um, it's all about Jesus and what he has done for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay.